Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for coming to this last slot session. So many people showed up. I'm glad to see everybody. Um, if you'd like to, please put into the chat uh, where you teach and who you teach. Are you teaching a class just of um, comprised all low literacy learners or do you have a mix? Um, and also um, language backgrounds. We'd like to know who's out there. My name's Suzanne McCurdy and um, currently, I'm at the University of Minnesota as a PhD student, but my real home is here with ABE. I've been a coordinator, a teacher, um, a teacher trainer, uh, and mostly in St. Paul, but all over Minnesota. So um, I'm really glad to be here. We're going to move on to the agenda. You'll meet our panelists very soon. Don't worry. I'm just going to look here at the chat. We've got people in Rochester, Owatonna, St. Joe, Moorhead, Minneapolis Public Schools, Apple Valley. Wonderful. Lots of um, mixed level classes, mixed, uh, lots of different language backgrounds. Oh, it's great to see everybody. People from Hubs, Orno. Wonderful. Thank you. Keep it coming and I'll keep checking the chat. Um, today, I'll do a quick pronunciation why and how, um, the theory behind what uh, pronunciation is and why we should uh, use it in the classroom. And then we'll move right on to our panelists, meeting them and having them answer some prepared questions. So the first questions, there's six questions, are ones that I've already prepared. Our panelists will answer those. And uh, during that time, if you can hold your questions for the final part, which is the open Q&A, we know you'll have questions and maybe also you'd like to share what you do. So if you can hold those until the end, um, you can certainly chat them and then we'll go through some of those in the open Q&A. Uh, we'll move right on to the why and how behind pronunciation instruction. Um, research shows that intentional research-based pronunciation instruction can improve intelligibility and comprehensibility of English learners. And, um, and this is for adults and adults who have been speaking English for a while. Pronunciation instruction can still have an impact even if someone's been using the patterns they're using for quite a while. And it really is just part and parcel of speaking and listening. Uh, you can't separate it from those two things. Um, and it just dramatically affects our language learners' ability to both understand others, because pronunciation is listening, and have others understand them. In general, in big terms, how should we approach pronunciation instruction? Uh, they've found that form-focused instruction, that's when we draw our learners' attention to patterns uh, in the language. Form-focused instruction that's contextualized, communicative, and mean meaningful is best for pronunciation instruction. Um, explicit awareness-raising instruction. So um, oftentimes, uh, people will think that our students will just pick up the pronunciation um, because they're hearing us use pronunciation, but it actually needs to be explicit and we need to draw their attention to those patterns. And then multimodal approaches. I know everybody does this with teaching anyway, um, everybody in this room. Um, 
using visuals, using um, having the students be able to hear it, maybe feel it, the kinesthetic type of techniques that we all like to use. That really helps with pronunciation instruction. And so this is um, this is a pronunciation workshop focused on low literacy learners. Um, and whether you work with low literacy or you're working with beginning learners, um, it's essential that we start at the beginning. We can't wait until um, until the intermediate or the advanced courses. So, um, as soon as they're learning to speak, there's pronunciation there. And then literacy level learners in particular, and this is why uh, we have Jamie and Anne, our panelists coming in. Um, literacy level learners, we need to um, just focus differently and teach differently because being literate is, a different um, uh, learning than for someone who's learning to read. So um, that's why we wanna look at how do we teach literacy level learners differently than we might teach students of other backgrounds when it comes to pronunciation. Uh, and that is why we've asked our panelists in. Um, Anne, are there any questions so far? to this point? There are not. Okay, thank you. Okay, so with that, let's get to the real meat of the presentation, um, asking questions of our panelists. I'd like them to be able to introduce themselves. So Jamie, Jamie Creel, why don't you come on and introduce yourself to everybody? Hi, I'm Jamie Creel, and I am an intro level um, English instructor at Cedar Riverside Adult Education Collaborative located in South Minneapolis. And uh, so what that means is we're at the CASAS 153 to 180 in that class. And again, though, that's just the reading scores, um, but they have an even mix of um, oral abilities and capabilities. Um, yeah, so I would say that about half are really true uh, less law or low literacy learners. Um, and the other half have some background of literacy. Oh, and actually I should mention the languages. Uh, we serve primarily East African students and the students in my class um, are primarily elderly and they are Somali and Oromo speakers. Great, thanks, Jamie. Anne, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, I'm Ann Nervig. I teach at the Hub Center in St. Paul. I teach a beginning level ELL class, um, a bit higher than what Jamie teaches. My students are um, primarily testing uh, 181, uh, excuse me, the 81 or the RX tests at uh, about 180 to 200. Um, I have both uh, beginning literacy students, so what we have been calling with Suzanne, the less low learners, the students that are mm -hmm. learning literacy skills in um, English for the first time. They do not have foundational literacy skills in their first language. Um, and I have about probably not quite half of my students uh, would be identified in that way. Uh, languages, I have many different languages in my classroom. Um, East African, we have Oromo, Amharic, uh, Somali speakers, Spanish speakers, Hmong, Karen, Chinese, um, some Vietnamese, uh, French every once in a while. So many different languages in my room. Thank you. Thank you both so much um, and thank you for coming. So let's start off with the first prepared question and I'll pose this first to Jamie. Um, Jamie, how do you react to this statement? Pronunciation instruction is too difficult for literacy learners. Um, my initial response to that is that my learners can do and learn the same amount and the same kinds of things that any other level can do. Um, 
it's just you just have to approach it differently it has to be taught differently and the way that I do that is through integration of routine um, learning task formats which I'm sure we can get into at a later point wonderful of course yeah and how do you react to this um I think pronunciation can be taught at any level, absolutely. But for the literacy level learners, um, some ways of some traditional ways of teaching pronunciation that rely on reading skills uh, don't work as well. If there's too much text in the material that you're trying to um, pull your pronunciation lessons from, students can get confused, they can have trouble focusing, um, they get distracted. Uh, instead of paying attention to the task at hand that you're wanting to, to practice. So mm -hmm. as long as you can adapt your materials, you can teach pronunciation. And we will be talking about that later. That's absolutely right. And I think we could probably slot anything into um, uh, the sentence where it says pronunciation instruction. And some some folks will think things are too difficult for literacy level learners. And I know that I've heard both Jamie and Anne say, you know, we just have to change our instruction. Nothing's too difficult. We just need to approach it differently. Okay, great. Let's go on to the next question. Um, Anne, what pronunciation features do you address in lessons? So I try to focus on sounds that impede students' intelligibility or that would uh, increase their intelligibility. For example, uh, some students have trouble pronouncing the final consonant sound of words. Um, I'm sure many of you know just what I'm talking about. Um, desk, for example, is de or maybe des. Um, job is jaw. Uh, so landing on these final consonant sounds is really important for intelligibility. Um, without significant context, dropping that final sound uh, sometimes makes the word completely often, makes the word completely unrecognizable. Um, another example would be adding an extra syllable. Um, we have speakers who will add um, E, you know, like desky or milky or <laughs> appointment E, which is pretty easy to understand, but I'm used to hearing that. So it's easy for me to understand. Um, it may not be for mm -hmm. everyone. So um, those would be uh, pronunci those would be um, skills that I would work on. Uh, certain certain pronunciation skills that I would not necessarily work on with a large group might be um, th sound, for example, pronouncing a th as a d. Uh, you know, probably not going to really um, really affect the students their intelligibility. So um, that would be one. Maybe I would work on in a in one on one situation. Um, other things that I would work on would be or that I do work on are um, counting syllables, right? That's super important for pronunciation um, in English, syllables and then the syllab syllabic stress. Um, stressing the wrong syllable, even if you're pronouncing all of the sounds correctly, can make you unintelligible. Um, we've all heard, you know, emphasis on the wrong syllable, right? So if you're, <laughs> <laughs> if you're if, as a listener, if you're listening to somebody who's consistently stressing incorrect syllables, you have to work really, really hard to understand them. So that's something that I, I call attention to. That's great. Yes. Um, and it, if anyone's new to the uh, pronunciation field, when we talk about intelligibility, it's, um, can the student be understood um, in contrast to getting rid of their accent? So, right, um, and saying that she really focuses on what impairs that ability to be understood or intelligibility. Ooh. Jamie, what do you do? Very similar to what Anne does. Um, we think about those sounds that impact intelligibility. I, before I got into integrating pronunciation into my lessons, I was one of them who thought that T versus TH was really what was impacting the ability to be understood. And it's not, um, it, it's about stretching mm -hmm. out those vowel sounds. And so we do work on um, certain vowel and consonant sounds. Um, you know, if it's ah versus ah, and it's uh, impacting what they're saying, like hatch versus hot, um, so, and when I do sounds 
um, or we work on those segmentals or sounds, it's usually something that's born out of what I'm hearing them say. And then I will actively try to create an activity embedded in a routine. So they're used to seeing an activity like that so we can practice that. Um, we also work on word stress, word level stress. Um, and, uh, and then syllables as well. Um, so one thing I'll do with them is uh, to sort of convey the, the concept of syllables is I'll clap, um, you know, how many times for the word, like um, think or broken, and I'll say how many, and we'll be able to say one or two, and then we do a sorting activity. So that's a way to convey that concept at that level. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I do is uh, sentence level stress as well. So where, um, and then, and rhythm as well. So where your voice goes up and down in the sentence and, you know, I'll, I'll kind of act that out for them where it's, are we putting stress on every single syllable or is it varied? Yeah. Yeah. Is it that um, musical kind of rhythm to English of going up and down? Um, and I know I've seen you do that, Jamie, and it's really fun to watch. Um, something that Anne said, and I know Jamie has said this before, and I'm sure everybody here has had this experience of a student saying that um, only you can understand them, or you know yourself that you can understand them, but someone outside the school might not be able to, or even a teacher who doesn't work with that demographic. Um, perhaps your students are Karen and uh, a friend teacher only works with Somali students and they won't be able to understand uh, the features or the speech of your learners. So uh, yes, it, it's important to keep in mind that uh, you can understand it, but if a student is deleting sounds like at the end of a word, like Ann said, or adding a sound, it it might be something that's difficult for someone who's not in your position to understand. Okay, so I think the takeaway though for what pronunciation features do you address is what gets in the way of intelligibility, right? Okay. Okay, so for this next question, uh, we'll start with Jamie. Uh, Jamie, what are some of the challenges of integrating pronunciation into your classes? One thing that I've um, noticed is um, at when we're working with beginning students, um, there, there is a need to recycle or repeat content consistently. And so if I'm noticing something and I bring it up in the class and address it, then I have to be intentional about integrating it again, um, maybe in a different way through another kind of routine later on. So they're continuously giving that kind of practice. And um, also that a lot of the materials that are available to us, um, I think as Anne mentioned before, are text heavy, um, and that we want to be sure that we're separating that. But so they're not practicing how to decode, rather they're, they're focusing on pronunciation. Yeah, so I would say that those those two things are my main challenges. Okay, Anne, what's your take on this? Yeah, um, I, I think as I said before, and, and Jamie just alluded to it as well, one of the challenges is um, the materials that are, are available. Um, materials are generally, books are generally written for um, students who have some, some literacy skills, who have some, some basic academic skills, understanding how to move from exercise A to exercise B, understanding the little, a little box over on the side is sort of extra, and that doesn't come after <laughs> what might be printed next to it necessarily. So some of those just the basic academic skills that are expected in a text um, so that would be um, a challenge. The, the text that we use, there's actually, if you don't mind, Suzanne, I think the next slide is a screenshot from the textbook that we use at Hubs. This is um, Future. It's a, it's a 
uh, Pearson publication. It's a great textbook and they do have pronunciate targeted pronunciation lessons in each unit. Um, but the way that it's presented on the page, there's just too much text for these, these LESLA learners, these literacy level learners that we're talking about today. The students get distracted by trying to read what's in that little box. They um, sort of inexplicably start to try to read things at the bottom of the page instead of starting at the top. So it's hard to stay focused. Mm -hmm on the, the targeted pronunciation pronunciation lesson um, at hand. So another, I think you can go off of that now. <laughs> and that, yeah, question. just answer the question. Sure, I'm done yeah. talking about that textbook. Um, another challenge is for me is how to present the pronunciation lesson. Um, if full disclosure, when Suzanne and I first started talking about pronunciation, I thought, I don't know anything about teaching pronunciation. I'm not really sure if I do. Well. I do. Um, talking with Suzanne really helped me um, sort of recognize how I do do it in my class and why. Um, something that I think a lot about is, is um, how to present a pronunciation lesson. Is it in the context of a text or a unit theme or in isolation, right? Like, um, do I focus on uh, the, the vocabulary words and we work with those from our unit theme, uh, our theme or do I do, uh, do I focus on specific uh, sounds like, for example, um, CVC words with a short O in the middle, right? Um, and I think both of those um, approaches have their place and are, are useful. Um, if the words are in the context of a text, though, sometimes, you know, learners get distracted, they try to read ahead. Um, and if I take words out of context, students will get distracted by the meaning of the words. So these are some challenges uh, that I have noticed in teaching pronunciation. What's the best way to do it? Yeah, definitely. And I think some of our folks who teach higher levels will have some of those challenges too. Um, the going ahead or getting distracted, pretty perennial problem. Plot, put, put, put problems out there for us. Oops, sorry, everybody, I'm okay. Technical problems for me. Um, now, Anne, you just uh, finished speaking, but um, for this next question, I'll, the challenges you were talking about, you know, um, well, then why don't we just throw it in the bin? <laughs> why is it important to still do this? Yes, well, um, I my my prepared response for this was exactly what you've already said, Suzanne. It's it's critically okay. important because my students um, tell me that they want people to understand them. Um, they they give me that feedback. They say, you know, you teacher, you understand me. People at the store don't understand me. My 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 kids' teachers don't understand me. Mm. Um, so I, I you know imagine what it would feel like to just constantly be having to repeat yourself or say, thinking to yourself, I know I'm using the right words. Why am I not being understood? So um, that's that's why we do it. Yeah. How about you, Jamie? I know one of my goals um, as a teacher at this level is to help establish a firm oral foundation. And we actively work on that well before we'll get to a text. And I've noticed sort of a marked difference in um, intelligibility and then also a willingness on um, some of my Shire learners to speak in class when before they weren't sure or they, you know, I wasn't understanding oh. them or they weren't being understood by their peers. Um, so I think just because it is such a goal to establish that oral foundation with, with, these, with these folks, um, that's one of the reasons why it, it's important to integrate pronunciation instruction. Yeah, this, um, this importance of reading that really is in the forefront whenever we talk about LESLA or low literacy learners, it really all depends on the oral skills. Um, really good points here. Okay, um, let's go on to the next question, switching gears a little bit. Jamie, we're going to start with you on this one. Uh, many pronunciation instruction materials are created for learners with extensive literacy skills, as we've talked about, and formal education. What types of adaptations do you need to make to fit available materials into your context? So I actually, um, I don't use 
textbooks that are available. Um, I've used materials that were created specifically for less low learners. And so on purpose, there are a lot of visuals, a lot of pictures and images. Mm. Um, and so that's, it's not really an adaptation. It's just that that's what I actively search for. Um, but then also as an instructor, I'm very physical in the way I show uh, a pronunciation feature. So for example, in word level stress, um, I'll also use the word broken like I had before. You know, I might use my hand, broken, broken. So they can physically feel it um, mm -hmm. and that helps to convey the concept. So it's a lot of um, things that I'm doing um, at sort of the instructional level, I would say that's more of an adaptation to existing materials. Um, let's see here. Yeah, and that um, I'm actively using um, routines or learning task formats. That's another thing. Um, so what I do, um, so a learning task format, if you're not familiar, is a specific way the activity is, the way it's structured doesn't change, the directions don't change, You but you can take content in and out of it. Um, so learners focus on the content as opposed to what does the teacher want me to do? And right. so I intentionally do that. Um, and sometimes that might mean I'm, I take something that exists and put that into an existing framework that I have. And that does take some time for me, but it seems to be helpful um, for my students. Um, let's see here. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think that's that's all I had. Okay, thank you. And how about you? Yeah. Um, the textbook, the example that was on the slide earlier um, was a screenshot of a full page of a textbook. Something that I do a lot of um, is I'll just make a copy of just the, the, the example that I want them to look at or the particular exercise in the text that I want them to look at. I'll project rather than projecting that whole page. Um, I think you're, you actually have a slide. Yeah, there we go. This is maybe what they will see on the on the board instead of seeing that full page. This is much easier for them to follow. This is focused. So I do a lot of this. Um, I might make a make a copy and give this to certain to some students. Um, I, I adapt differently within the classroom because I do I, because my students are um, at higher reading levels than um, Jamie's students. I I do have students who have who are reading quite well, and um, they don't necessarily need things quite so simplified. So um, I'll maybe have them have the textbook in front of them, and then I'll give uh, something that I have created that's more focused to the students who need who need that. Um, something else I will do is um, I'll pull words from the reading ahead of time, and we'll spend some time working on. Um, just particular words uh, before we actually get to the meat of the lesson and something that we're going to look at in just a couple minutes is an example of um, one way I do this. Very good. I love it. Yeah, I um, something Jamie said that just seemed like, oh, this is a great way to adapt existing material that really uh, doesn't take anything ahead of time was um, using your body or have your students use their body. I know Anne does this too, and we'll see that soon in a picture, but just using your arm or like this to show stress, broken like that, um, or just uh, copying or cutting off the part of the page you don't want, right? We don't need to make complete new materials, just add a little layer on. Okay, um, this one starts with Anne. Uh, why are routines important? Both you and Jamie have mentioned that. Um, why are they so important at the literacy level and how have you incorporated pronunciation into those routines? Okay, so I believe that the answer to this question has some visuals to go along with it, but um, yes. I a quick answer. Uh, routines are important at all levels, I think. I, as a teacher, I, as a person, like routine. I need it. It feels secure, and it, it's the consistency is good for me, and so I want that in my classroom. Yeah. Um, so respond well to routine. Everything just goes a little bit more smoothly when there's a, when there's a routine. 
So something that I have done, um, a specific uh, reading and pronunciation routine that I've incorporated into my classroom um, is a, a, a lesson from, I use uh, stories from the Anne, Anne Gianola, I think is the, is the, mm -hmm. Uh, the text Easy Stories Plus. I love those. She has many, many books. That's the specific one that I'm going to be talking about here right now. So Suzanne, do you want to go ahead and flip to the next? <laughs> okay. Good. So Yes. Yep. So there are a few slides here that show um, this particular routine that I use with my students. So the first thing I do before introducing the story is I pull out about a dozen vocabulary words. Uh, they have, the students have not seen the story yet. I pull out words for myself, I choose them. I choose words that are um, either high frequency words, sight words, uh, or highly relevant to the students' daily lives. And, and from the text, I put these words into a slideshow and I project the first word. The learners sound it out um, or they they read it if they have you know the reading skills to do that um, they they guess at it maybe they look at it uh, and then i add a picture okay there we go so we've got washing machine at this point i say the word washing machine and the students repeat we do this a few times oh they like this they have lots of thoughts about this they enjoy this, yeah. this activity. they love seeing pictures and after we say the word a few times, we count the syllables in the word. And I think then uh, maybe don't, oh, nope, not yet. Sorry. Oh, back. <laughs> okay. I thought it was a different picture. We count the syllables. So this is actually a pretty complex example. Most of my words are not this complex, um, but this particular story was called Laundry Problem and it was about uh, a washing machine. So we Wanted, yeah. I wanted to use this vocabulary word. So we count the syllables, right? And we we clap, washing machine. Okay, and the students do it, washing machine. We do a lot of clapping. Um, they know that routine. They know how to count syllables. They know to use their bodies to help to count the syllables. And then they call out and they're always right answers. They're always wrong answers. Mm -hmm. And then I show on the board, um, I, I divide where those syllables are. And I think that's like yeah, let's go forward to that one. Forward and to that one. Come back. There you go. You can see that. So washing machine. Okay, four syllables there. Um, this one's a little tricky because it's a compound noun. And so either of these words separately would have, you know, their own stress. But because it's together, there's one washing machine, right? Washing machine. So we together do that and we washing machine. And I use a lot of I'm very physical when I teach, so I use my body a lot to show kind of, I'm not exactly sure what I'm doing in that picture, but you can see that I'm moving. <laughs> and yeah. we find out where that, where the stress is. Oh, it's on the first syllable. Okay, so we do that. So we've spent some time just on that word. And then you can go back a slide. I pass out these words that we've already talked about and read and um, pronounced. I pass them out to the tables. I have two students per table in my classroom. So each pair gets these words and um, they lay all the words out. And then I say a word, I read a word, wash, and they have to find it. And it's, it's a game, they love it. Um, we do this several times. And again, this is a routine in my classroom. They like to see how fast I can read the words and how fast they can identify them. Um, and I like them to understand this is, helps them understand that they don't have to sound out or decode every single word. They can recognize a word without having to sound it out. So, you know, there's a bit of that whole language in there. Um, and then they work with part in partners together and they do the same thing. One student's the teacher and one student is, is the, the student. And um, I tell them to practice the pronunciation, think very carefully about um, the, the, the stress, the syllabic stress on each word. I kind of walk around and listen and correct as needed. And um, eventually we get around to reading the story. That's great. So this is part of a reading lesson, right? You don't have to do a a uh, pronunciation lesson. This is a routine that Anne already has and already had and then incorporated the pronunciation into that. And the pronunciation in this case was mostly word stress. So that was great. Thank you so much, Anne. A uh, Jamie, 
Why do you think routines are important and how do you incorporate pronunciation? Oh my goodness. Like my entire week is, is based on routine. Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays have a specific focus. And so Mondays, for instance, are vocabulary routines. Mm-hmm. And that includes, okay, so we have a, you know, a pre-reading thing would be showing the images from the story without the text and you try to elicit vocabulary okay so we're trying to elicit the words that we're going to be focusing on um and then we move to the flashcards with the actual pictures of the words um and focus then on um so we repeat maybe say the word in their own language and then we practice pronouncing words, focusing on those commonly difficult consonants or vowels um, that impact intelligibility. And you know, you have to sort of be judicious about that. It's just depending on what I'm hearing, of course. And then we do word stress. And um, and this is all before they're seeing any text whatsoever. And so what I'll do is, you know, we'll practice with the hand movements. Um, if it's a two syllable word or something, you know, um, if it's one, it's just, you know, you just try to, we'll, we'll work on the sounds with that. But if you want to move to the next Your year first one. where I've got, okay, so we're a little low tech at Cedar, <laughs> um, <laughs> but this is, this is an That's example. Great, yeah, this is an example of a, the sorting activity with, you know, one versus two syllables and, you know, sync tub and I'll say how many and then we'll, we'll practice them together and then you know have students individually say how you know where does it go one or two um and so that's how we practice um identifying syllables okay um and yeah. then so that's a Monday vocabulary routine so if we move to the next one this is um, when we're working working on that sentence level sort of stress, and I actively um, will sort of draw down or up, you know, depending on where your voice goes down or your voice goes up, so they can. That's just another way to integrate a visual um, mm-hmm. to create rhythm, and you know, where it's up is where the stress is, and um, and so we go through several of these examples together, um, you know, prior to the text even being shown actually. And then once the text is shown, I'll do the drawing. Um, and then, um, so next you know, slide. what's that? Oh, sorry. I thought you needed the next slide. Go oh, ahead. No, no. We're good. So it's, you know, what is the problem? The sink is broken. And we go through several of those examples together. Um, and that that leads into the info gap next which is next yes and I would I believe the author of this info gap is in the session with us today Chris class so I want to give them a, uh, a shout out for providing the material for me <laughs> hi Chris um so yeah so here's the question we do a lot of practicing on the question um you know in We'll practice it in chunks first. What is the problem? You know, what is the problem? And then integrate it all together. And we do that several times. And then we've run, we run through several examples with the answers. Um, and then they're, they're paired up. Um, you know, the, the sink is leaking. The toilet is leaking. The tub is leaking. And so that this was an existing uh, routine or learning task format that um, that they're familiar with on Wednesdays. And so it's just more intentionally building in time for that oral practice and before they get even in, get into the, the text. So, yeah. This is wonderful. And again, it's not a full on pronunciation lesson. It's a lesson that has pronunciation in it, which for the learners, it's better to have it connected like this. Um, Jamie and Anne, I can't thank you enough. All of these um, ideas are so wonderful. We are behind time, um, not surprisingly, 
Um, but we still have a few minutes if anyone would like to ask, ask a question. I do have a question for Jamie already in the chat. Uh, Jamie, what are your best learning task formats? So um, in general, what would a what would be the um, format, let's say for a Monday or for something? For a Monday, um, the the one learning task format that there that we always have is a grid of um, images for the week's vocabulary, and it's usually around eight to ten words. And we do a lot of practice where they are able to identify if I say it, they can point to it. Um, and then, you know, after all the pronunciation instruction, um, they will independently write the word beneath the picture. So they have that then to keep and study from. So they will they will see that um, every Monday as part of the vocabulary routine. Okay. So it's kind of another word for, for routine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it essentially is, yeah. And Chris Kloss um, is sharing an idea that um, they like to have the students count how many times their chin hits their hand when they say the word so they can see how many syllables there are. Chris, um, I know what you're talking about, but do you wanna come on and show us? If not, I can, hi. Hi, <laughs> how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good. Good. Uh, I can use the washing machine example. I I struggle sometimes with pronunciation and stress, especially myself. And so it's like a really good practice for me to stick my hand under my chin and we'll say it together. Washing machine. Washing and machine. yeah, say it nice and slowly. Washing, washing machine. machine. Mm -hmm. Your mouth has to open to make the vowel sounds and vowels are what decide where our syllables end up. And so your chin ends up hitting your hand every time you make a syllable. And I like that because then the students are counting it. They're not dependent on me to, you know, show them or tell them where those syllables are. They can count at least how many there should be mm -hmm. when we together. And then um, it makes a really nice tie into counting the vowel sounds and things like that. Yes. Um, and you're right, it, it gives a nice physical indication and also um, they are doing it and they can each do it on their own. Um, and then from the syllables, you, you start talking about stress. Um, we have a question here from Mike. So pronunciation practice first and then practice decoding. Does decoding sometimes hinder pronunciation? Some Somali students with some literacy get confused with English vowels because they have learned them in Somali. Um, so in general to the panel here, uh, pronunciation practice first and then practice decoding and does decoding sometimes hinder pronunciation? Anybody wanna take a stab at that? Um, I try to separate those as much as I can, at least get a lot of um, oral practice in before we do decoding. Um, on Tuesdays, we spend a lot of time with phonics and then where it's the, um, you know, the practicing those vowel sounds and, you know, it, it's so we'll practice those vowel sounds like ah versus ah and like what your mouth looks like. And it's it's weird once you start doing it, but they'll 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 do it with you. Um, and so we'll we'll do that orally first, and then we'll look at the word. Okay, say that, say that one, and it'll be like hot. Like, okay, do this with me. Hot versus hat, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so we we really um do the try to get them to to, to work on the pronunciation skill and then at least for my level of learning, then we get to the text. Yeah. I do want to interject here that um, we are over time by two minutes. I 
I can stay here if people have questions, but I want to make sure everyone knows that um, you are free to leave and there are some in affinity groups coming up after this. Anne, did you have time to address that question? Um, I think Jamie did a great or job. Jamie, yep, I, I do too. I think Jamie did a great job. Chris, do you want to stick around and ask her question about feedback? Or do you have to run? I, I can stay for a few minutes if Jamie and Ann have time. Okay. Um, so I, I'm thinking back to like, I think it might be a Patsy paper uh, about lesser learners having a harder time noticing feedback. Like you give them feedback and they mm -hmm. don't know how to incorporate it. And I think that paper is focused on Anna's group. Okay, um, uh, on literacy and mm -hmm. stuff. But I think the same thing happens with pronunciation. Like you teach a skill, the students try to incorporate it. They have a really hard time noticing, maybe sometimes. And so I was wondering if Jamie or Anne, you have some. I'll, I'll, and I'll say the reason I'm asking this question is because I'm teaching ELLB and the, these students do have more literacy than the ones that you're working with, but I still notice, I think it's the students with limited and interrupted formal education, not being able to incorporate that feedback. So I was wondering if you um, had some suggestions or ways that you sort of help students incorporate feedback, especially in the area of pronunciation? Um, I think sometimes I have a hard time disentangling whether it's like a listening discrimination issue. Um, are they having a hard time hearing it? Are they nodding along with me and telling me that they understand it? You know, um, I actually, I think that um, I know initially I wasn't spending enough time on sort of the the listening part of it. Are they, are what are they hearing? Um, and I noticed that when they when they are able to do that, then they seem to be integrating it with, into that instruction into what they do. And, um, you know, and then it's just a matter of recycling, I think, the the skill over and over again um, and doing it in different ways and getting the repetition built in there. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was in a, a presentation earlier with Adam about um, digital literacy skills, and he said something that stuck with me, um, slow down and do it again, slow down and do it again. And so I think, mm -hmm. you know, it's 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 just that repetition and continually calling attention to the particular um, thing that you're wanting the student to be working on. But I think also we can't underestimate um, <laughs> you know, the the importance, it's not the importance of, but the 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 reality that our, our mouths, the muscles in our mouths have developed to speak a, a particular language, right? And so when you're learning a second or third or fourth or fifth language, those muscles just aren't necessarily well developed for some of the sounds that we're really wanting them to try to work on. So um, yeah, that's something that's very specific to a particular sound to this type, this speaker, or a particular sound to this speaker. But um, I, I recognize that too. And so um, that's that's another challenge. <laughs> All right. Well, we've, we've got. Oh, Marisa, were you? Um, I was going to say we probably need to close the meeting. Okay. Do you, is, do you have any uh, last thing uh, to say, Suzanne? Um, I do not, except um, Michelle, I'll get in touch with you. I saw that you had a question. Um, so I will get in touch with you. And then I'll also add some materials to the folder, Marisa, that gives some general tips about teaching pronunciation in general. Great. So those materials will be uh, available in the participant folder next week sometime. Thanks okay. so much to our presenters. This was wonderful. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here. And again, we do have affinity groups coming up. Um, those links are here if you need that. Um, mm -hmm. Well, flyer copy will work. So thanks again, everyone.